turn on their cameras, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome. Welcome uh, everybody on behalf of SEPS uh, to this webinar. Again, thanks for your patience for being with us. We have very high level participation into what is a very topical subject. Uh, my name is Sergio Carrera. I'm senior research fellow at SEPS and also professor at the European University Institute. And I will be chairing, moderating this conversation, this panel today. Uh, the webinar titled Monitoring the Rule of Law in the European Union. As I said, a very topical subject and bringing us back to the very foundations of the European Union, uh, a union anchored in this trinity of constitutional values, the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. And while the specific features of the notion of the rule of law vary across national constitutions, the concept of the rule of law is not a pie in the sky, it's not an empty shell. Uh, the United Nations, the Council of Europe, and more recently, the European Union have brought light to the importance of the separation of powers principle. This checks and balances of authority to prevent arbitrariness, to the importance of well-functioning and healthy democracies and democratic scrutiny, and the fundamental importance of judicial protection uh, before independent courts. Now, in the EU legal system, these values find expression in the treaties, uh, Article 2 of the treaties, but also the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and they are operationalized in Article 7 of the treaties, which is, gives clear mandate to both Commission and the European Parliament to determine the existence of a risk of serious breach of these values, or actually a persistent breach of these very principles. And what is clear is that the development in some EU member states during the last decade have clearly illustrated that rule of law and human rights monitoring and compliance is not only relevant in the context of enlargement and foreign affairs, but it is also crucial after accession to the EU, it cannot be taken for granted. Once any country accedes to the European Union, we have, as a matter of fact, two EU member states currently under Article 7 procedure, uh, based on clear evidence on systematic rule of law backsliding. There are other EU member states that present theme specific challenges and dilemmas, not showing systematicity of violations, but clearly showing also hints that call for attention. And there have been many voices, many voices, some of them here uh, in the panel of today, and of course the Commissioner Reinders himself, calling for the EU to develop its own monitoring arm of all EU member states' compliance with these principles. So as we will see today, there are many lessons learned from international and regional uh, human rights monitoring actors and methodologies. We have the United Nations represented, the Council of Europe represented, how to do this. And uh, there is indeed very fruitful cooperation between the European Union institutions and the UN and the Council of Europe. Um, uh, very close cooperation and mutually beneficial cooperation. But perhaps the time has come for the EU indeed to develop its own mechanisms. And this is also why we organized this event originally, the publication by the European Commission of the Rule of Law Report, which is a welcomed a step forward in how the EU is monitoring all EU member states' compliance with treaty principles, but also the European Parliament's work, uh, very active work in this subject, calling for a mechanism covering democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights, and the excellent work and very active work of the Libe Committee uh, in different country reports. Now, why is this important? Because, you know, when we are moving within the confine of the EU legal system, member states' compliance with these values is a precondition for mutual trust. 
There's no such a thing as blind trust in European cooperation. And it needs to be earned, it needs to be deserved to, for governments to benefit, you know, to, 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 you know, to um, be able to benefit from European integration, but also to have their own responsibilities, to show their commitments to their responsibilities as EU member states. And now the discussion being held on the budget, we will go into detail later. Can we really trust member states under Article 7 procedure in EU budget expenditure? How can we ensure that EU taxpayers' money will not be used in backsliding rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights? And just before going into the subject, a few examples showing how clear linkages there are in EU-specific policies. For instance, when an, any EU member state dismantled the independence of its court system or has substandard detention conditions, there can be no trust on questions like the European arrest warrant, on extradition and surrender, or when a member state engages in pushbacks or arbitrary detention of asylum seekers at EU external borders, there can be no trust in a Schengen cooperation, a common European asylum system. Or last, when a EU member state sells EU citizenship or free movement to millionaires, how can we trust that that member state complies with EU citizenship requirements and standards? So these are very important uh, questions uh, that uh, are at the heart of today's uh, conversation and discussion. And I see that Commissioner Rindus has now joined us. Thank you, Commissioner, for being with us. We are delighted to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Sorry <laughs> for the delay, but the another meeting about the rule of law. You know that we have some uh, sensitive issues for the moment in the European Union about the rule of law. And uh, sorry for that, but uh, we try to, to be present also in your webinar. <laughs> we are very glad and very happy to have you back at SEPS in this conversation. And uh, we have now 196 participants in this event, which shows the, you know, the interest in this conversation. So we will start with you, Commissioner, with a keynote uh, a speech, and, before, and then we will be followed by a discussion panel that I will introduce in a minute. But just to remind us about the question of this event, how to ensure highest quality monitoring? How to ensure highest quality monitoring? What can we learn? from experiences in the UN, the Council of Europe. Uh, and more generally, what is the role of monitoring the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights in European integration? So after Commissioner Reinders uh, keynote, we have four excellent, I'm so glad to have these four discussants. Um, so we will start with Juan Fernando López Aguilar, who is a member of the European Parliament, chair of the LIBE committee, um, second chairing of that committee, in fact, it is to be termed uh, as parliamentary member of the European Parliament. Um, so really thanks a lot, Juan, for joining us um, today. And we will follow with Pineke Strick, also a member of the European Parliament, representing the Greens Group in the LIBE Committee, and also professor at the University of Nijmegen, Bradford University of Nijmegen. Thank you, Pineke, for joining us uh, today. And then we will have the Council of Europe and the United Nations represented. The Council of Europe um, will be represented by Hane Juncker. She's the head of justice and legal cooperation in the Directorate General dealing with rule of law and human rights. So thank you, Jane, Hane, for being with us. And the last discussion is Birgit van Hout. Uh, so glad to have the United Nations uh, High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights Office uh, with us uh, in this uh, conversation. So each of you will have seven minutes. This is a short event, we will be running for one hour. So if you could keep it to seven minutes, the discussions will be great. And for all of you who are with us, your feedback and questions are welcomed. Please use the Q&A option in the Zoom. My colleagues will be filtering them and sending them to me, and I will be posting them to the panel. Okay, without further ado, Commissioner Reinders, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you very much. And um, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for this uh, invitation for the presentation, maybe of the first edition of the European uh, Commission's annual rule of law 
uh, report. We are already starting the preparation of the second one with uh, all different uh, stakeholders. It's a very important, in fact, to have uh, discussions like the one we are having today. It is what the report is all about, uh, triggering debates on the rule of law, engaging uh, people across the union, and strengthening a rule of law culture in the European Union. Think tanks such as SEPs uh, are crucial in this regard for facilitating debates and reflections on this topic. Uh, the Commission wants to set up a yearly cycle with the rule of law report at the heart of it. Uh, it represents an innovative approach aiming at protecting the rule of law and promoting it. Uh, through this yearly cycle, uh, we want to prevent problems from emerging or deepening. We want to raise joint awareness on the rule of law across the Union and to keep the topic high on the political agenda by uh, stimulating open debates and exchange of best practices year after year. Our yearly report focuses on, on developments in the Union since the beginning of 2019, both positive, of course, and negative. It includes a country a specific assessment of all the 27 member states, as well as an overview of the um, emergency measures take, uh, uh, took in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic were relevant. It draws attention to emerging or deepening challenges and highlights good practices. Through this report, we do not only want to build a rule of law culture, we also want to make EU citizens better aware of what the rule of law actually means for them in their daily life, because it's very important uh, to explain to the citizens what is the influence of the rule of law in their uh, daily life, like for the businesses and for other actors. Let me also say a few, word, uh, a few words on um, how the report was established. In January this year, I wrote to all ministers of EU Affairs to establish a network of national rule of law contact points. It was important to have const constant communication with the member states and to discuss the methodology of our report. And I'm glad to say that all the member states, I have said all the member states, participated in the process and provided written input. We also carry out a targeted stakeholder consultation where over 200 stakeholders provided also written input. This include AU agencies, national and European civil society organizations, and professional organizations. And uh, we conducted more than in the COVID-19 crisis, 300 virtual country visits to discuss rule of law developments with member states. And we discussed, of course, with national authorities, including with judicial and other independent authorities and with relevant stakeholders such as journalists associations. Lastly, every member state had the opportunity to check its draft country chapter for factual accuracy. What was important for us was that all member states had an equal part to play in the process. We applied the same methodology to all member states and constantly ensured Const uh, co consistency. It was very important to be coherent and to apply exactly the same methodology to all the member states. In that respect, I want to stress that our assessment has been informed by widely recognized standards, such as those of the Council of Europe. It also refers to EU laws requirements, including the rulings from the European Court of Justice. We made sure that this process was robust, transparent, and as inclusive as possible. But I also want to make it clear that the final product represents the Commission's own assessment. So it's a real assessment from the Commission, and you know the Commission is the guardian of the treaties. This takes me to uh, key findings. Uh, we looked at four key areas, the independence, quality, and efficiency of justice systems, the anti-corruption framework, media pluralism and media freedom, and other institutional checks and balances. Firstly, on the uh, independence, quality and efficiency of justice systems. I'm pleased to see that a number of member states are making efforts 
to strengthen judicial independence and reduce the influence of the executive or legislative powers over the judiciary. I appreciate the efforts to set up or strengthen independent national councils for the judiciary. Uh, it's an example. But it is also true that judicial independence remains an issue of concern in certain member states. For example, um, as regards the capacity of councils for the judiciary to exercise their functions, we have also more structural concerns about, about uh, an increasing influence of the executive and legislative branches in, on the functioning of the justice systems, including constitutional courts and supreme courts. In terms of quality of justice, the current pandemic has highlighted the need to speed up the digitalization of justice. Many initiatives are ongoing to deliver real improvement. Some justice systems are already well equipped with the technology to operate remotely. There's uh, good practices to share. Investing in justice is also more necessary than ever. And I have asked to all the ministers of justice in the last meeting with the ministers of justice in the entire Europe to pay attention uh, to such a digitalization of justice in the recovery and resilience plans that the national authorities will introduce or are introducing now to the Commission, if it's possible to have an agreement on the MFF and the next generation AU in the next days or weeks. It is reassuring that some member states have decided to increase resources in the area of the resources for justice system, human resource, but also digital uh, tools. Secondly, the uh, anti-corruption framework. I appreciate again that several member states have recently adopted new comprehensive anti-corruption strategies or revised existing ones. It is, however, important that these strategies are effectively implemented and monitored to ensure that progress is made on the ground. Some member states have introduced measures to strengthen the institutional capacity to fight corruption and to reduce obstacles to effective prosecution. But our monitoring shows concerns in several member states about the effectiveness of the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of corruption cases. This includes concerns that high-level corruption cases are not systematically pursued. Thirdly, on media pluralism and uh, media freedom, an encouraging finding is that the independence of media authorities is enshrined in law in every member state. Although there are concerns in some regards um, with uh, different kind of situations in different member states. First, the political influence on the media, then a lack of transparency when it comes to media ownership and risk to journalists and other media actors. We have seen in the last years uh, some murders of journalists, but different kind of uh, attacks like the so-called slaps, different actions in justice, but also different other kind of actions on the social media and so And it's very important to take care of this, uh, this situation. So it's not just about what is in the law, but also how it's possible to implement the law and what is the concrete situation on the ground. The fourth area of the report concerns uh, institutional checks and balances. The national parliaments play a central role here. On the positive side, there is a healthy debate in some member states on strengthening a rule of law culture. Positive reforms can emerge from such public debates. I welcome also the new channels for citizens to challenge the exercise of executive and legislative power in a number of member states. Cooperating with international expert bodies such as the Venice Commission, can contribute to ensuring that reforms will, com will comply with European standards. And I insist all the time on the fact that it's needed uh, to have uh, a real advice of the Venice Commission in the way to proceed for some constitutional reforms or very important reform in relation with the justice systems. The COVID-19 pandemic is testing also the resilience of checks and balances. In this respect, the Commission has made it clear that responses to the crisis must respect fundamental principles and values settled in the treaties. 
key tests for emergency measures include whether they are limited in time, whether safeguards are in place to ensure that these measures are strictly necessary and proportionate, and whether parliamentary and judiciary oversight, as well as media and civil society scrutiny, are maintained. It's very important to continue to have such a control on the different measures take during the emergency period of time. The COVID-19 pandemic has sometimes provided good examples of uh, functioning checks and balances. Parliamentary scrutiny helped frame certain emergency response, and national courts often reviewed the measures taken, but we also identified a number of concerns with regard to checks and balances. In a few member states, we see parliaments uh, rushing through legislation or government making excessive use of accelerated emergency uh, laws. And so we did there to be sure that it's possible to have a correct functioning of all the uh, institutions in the checks and balances between the different institutions. This situation raised concerns. Across the EU, civil society continues to be a key actor in defending the rule of law, but in some member states, uh, civil society is facing serious challenges. National rules are limiting access to foreign funding, for instance, or they are subject to smear campaigns. So we need also to pay attention to that. And in some cases, it was needed maybe to go to the Court of Justice to receive a positive answer about the, the way to manage the different kind of funding and so far uh, foreign countries for, for the uh, civil society. So uh, that was the report that we have presented on the 30th of September uh, at the Commission level. But so where do we go from here? I would like to reinforce a point that I have made before. What we want to achieve through this mechanism is a deeper dialogue to foster a rule of law culture in all the member states. And we need such a dialogue at EU level with the European Parliament and the Council, and also at national level, as we are doing today. And there's a political will to do this. The German presidency has organized the rule of law di dialogue in the Council based on our report on 13, of, uh, on 13 of October. We had a first very constructive discussion in the General Affairs Council covering general rule of law development. So it was the first approach of the report. On 17 of November, we have had a country specific discussion uh, addressing key developments in some member states. We have started in the protocol order, so alphabetical order uh, of the member states with Belgium, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, uh, Denmark, and Estonia. Of course, we will take Germany in the next presidency uh, due to the fact that uh, Germany had the floor as uh, chair of the General Affairs Council. I hope so to continue the country specific discussions with the future presidencies. There is a clear commitment from the Portuguese and the Slovenian presidencies to do the same, to cover all the 27 member states in a real discussion at the Council level. Earlier this month, I also presented the, the report to the European Parliament, both in the Libe uh, Committee, and you have the chair with us today of the Libe Committee, and in the plenary. And I intend to bring the debate to all other European capitals, notably before national parliaments. I have uh, already done with the German Bundestag and the Danish parliament, but also with national civil society. And so I will continue with five or six uh, other parliaments before the end of the year, and we will start again at the beginning of next year, because I want to uh, organize the debate not only at the EU level, but also at the national level in all the national parliament. Because of course, in the um, council, we are in discussion with the government. In the parliament, in the European parliament, we have a representation from the different political parties in Europe. But it's also very important to go to the national parliament to discuss with the majority and the opposition and to see what are the, the concerns in the different parliament. But again, also to do that with civil society. And the time has come to have open political debates about the rule of law. I'm very happy to also talk about, about this with you because I've started four years ago in the previous capacity as a member of the General Affairs Council that was Foreign Affairs and the European Affairs to propose to organize a peer review at the Council level. And I've read the support immediately from many member states and also from the actual president of General Affairs Council, Michael Watt, German minister, 
And four years later, at the same moment in 2016, we have seen some initiatives of the, of the European Parliament in the same way to organize a discussion on the rule of law. And four years later, it was possible to present the first annual report on the rule of law. So I'm very proud of that because uh, it was possible to discuss during so many years about the budgetary situation in the member states, about the uh, structural reforms like the pension schemes. It's very important to do that. I have also take part in such a process as Minister of Finance many years ago, but it was very difficult to organize a real debate at the council level about the um, rule of law and the values. And now we try to discuss in all the institutions on this and the report has brought more substance to the table and we have reached a new level. The commission will of course continue to play its role as guardian as set of the treaties and to use all the other tools at its disposal whenever necessary to react to challenges to the rule of law. In 2018, the Commission presented a proposal to strengthen the EU budget and protect taxpayers' money from financial risks links, linked to uh, shortcomings in the rule of law, such as the uh, improper functioning of the judiciary and fraud or corruption. We need, in each member state, independent justice systems effective investigation and prosecution services, and an effective functioning of public authorities implementing the union budget. Under the proposal, the union could suspend, reduce, or restrict access to EU funding in proportion to the nature, gravity, and scope of the rule of law deficiencies. Trilogues between the Parliament and the Council and the, and the Commission have led to a preliminary deal between the co-legislators between the European Parliament and the Council. This deal will allow to protect the EU budget when it is established that breaches of the principles of the rule of law in the member state affect or are seriously linked, likely to affect the sound financial management of the EU budget uh, or the protection of the EU financial interest in a sufficiently uh, direct manner it will be possible to trigger this mechanism on a proposal from the Commission and after a qualified majority vote in the Member States. And so, again, uh, the Commission welcomes this uh, development, uh, which provides for an effective mechanism to protect the EU budget. And uh, I want to say that we'll continue to work on, uh, I said, the next annual report on the rule of law. So every year you will have a new document. I've seen that it was possible to receive very positive reactions from many member states coming with some plans uh, to introduce new reforms to give an answer to the concerns raised in the report. So it's fine. I've seen that with different member states coming with different new reforms to try to give an answer. Of course, we'll verify the implementation of those reforms in the next report. It's a preventive tool, but again, we have other tools like the infringement proceedings before the Court of Justice when we are thinking as better to use such an instrument, and we are doing that since also since the beginning of this mandate, the, this commission, we have introduced some proceedings before the court, and certainly in relation with the independence of the justice system, and we are very uh, proud that it's possible to see now also uh, real discussions at the council level about the rule of law, and a real discussion about the possibility to introduce such a real link between uh, the European budget and the uh, rule of law, uh, because I, I'm, no, I'm knowing that we have a real support in the European Parliament about the way uh, to uh, protect the rule of law. We have discussed a lot uh, of this in the Libe Committee, uh, but I know that there are so many supports from many actors in the uh, civil society, and it's very nice that it's possible now to have a real discussion at the highest level in the Council. And so all the institutions are involved in the discussion, and again, it's very important to do the same at the national level because the, the most efficient instrument that we have at our disposal is to try to convince the population in all the member states that it's very important to have a full respect for fundamental rights, democratic process, and the rule of law. And uh, to explain more and more what that means, the rule of law, in the daily life of the, the citizens. And it's the reason why I'm very proud to have such an opportunity to present to you the first ever we have set annual report on the rule of law, but not the last one. We are starting the preparation of the second one. And of course, I'm looking now 
uh, forward to hearing your remarks, your questions, and maybe your, your proposals. Thanks for such an opportunity, and sorry for the delay at the beginning of the meeting, because uh, we have had also various discussions just before about the situation of the rule of law in, in at least one member state in the uh, European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for your presentation and uh, for highlighting the, you know, the, the goals and the main findings in the rule of law report, a very commendable effort and contribution by the European Commission in this area. You were indeed one of those voices calling for, um, in early times, for a EU mechanism, EU instrument monitoring all EU member states, and this is now there. And uh, it is indeed very important to have this at the highest level, this discussion at the highest level in the Council. And uh, this, uh, of course, this report contributes to the knowledge base of uh, the situation for all the participants uh, listening to us. Uh, please feel free now to present your questions in the Q&A option. Uh, write them down. Please write your name. And I will do my best to bring it back to the panel. Um, but let's now move immediately to the next, uh, to the discussion panel, mm -hmm. with Juan Fernando being first. Juan, you have the floor. Good day. I hope you can hear me right and see me right. First of all, thank you, Sergio. And thank you, Seps, for the invitation. Nice to hear again from our Commissioner Reinders and good to be given the chance to present the case of the European Parliament, so heavily involved in all of these matters, rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy. Actually, it's a long story, but I'm about to make it short. So it takes some storytelling. Ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force in 2009, along with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, let's not forget it, we were very well aware in the European Parliament, the majority in the European Parliament, of course, the majority in the Libby Committee, which I chair, I chaired the committee precisely in the moment in which the treaty and the Charter entered into force, that that was a major leap forward for the European Union to turn the page from a protracted discussion about the very nature of the European experience. There were theories with the allegation that the European Union was actually a market constituting four freedoms, capitals, goods, services, and workers. But there was another theory to which I stick to, the theory that it goes political. It's been political all the way, but from the Lisbon Treaty onwards, with the Charter onwards, it's only clear that it's more political and constitutional than ever before. So the once called the Copenhagen criteria, which were adopted precisely to measure the consistency of democratic structures of those candidates to enter the club, to join the club on their way to enter the club, were enshrined, finally enshrined, are as binding legal principles, values, common values of constitutional nature, human dignity, liberty, equality, freedom, fundamental rights protected by independent judiciary in a structure of, of, of separation of powers ruled by law, which is not only rule of law, but also ruled by law and protecting minorities, which means protecting those in opposition to majorities. And of course, pluralism, enshrinement of pluralism of all kinds, which is some dimension of the European Union understood as the integration of diversity. Well, those values were finally enforced 10 years now, and they have been enforced all along. But you know what? Throughout this period, the European Union has somehow experienced a chain of crisis. The Great Recession, sovereign debt, Brexit, now the pandemic with all of its damage, but throughout the process, there has been also a political impact of this series of episodes, of critical episodes. The political impact has been the erosion of mutual trust and the erosion of the will of building up uh, an ever closer Europe as it was the promise of the Treaty of Lisbon when entered into force. The political expression of this erosion of mutual trust has a major challenge in the emergence of the so-called illiberal democracies, which is backsliding on the values, on the founding values of the European Union. Some countries, particularly of recent accession, which are in denial of the binding nature 
of those values are in denial of the tools at the disposal of the European architecture to make sure that we all comply by the book. We all comply by the rules of the game. We all comply by the rule of law, including fundamental rights and democracy. First, it came Hungary, then Poland, but you know, the scope keeps widening. And there has been concerns about a certain case in Malta, particularly the link between corruption and organized crime. There has been allegations about Bulgaria. So we cared about Bulgaria just recently, about the independence of judiciary in Romania too. So uh, the, the point is that those values are binding for us all. So it should encompass the examination of the validity and effectiveness of those values to us all. That is why we took so seriously those, those principles and values enshrined in Article 2. That is why the European Parliament put up a two-thirds majority to launch the se Article 7 procedure about Hungary. And then later on, further up on the road, the Article 7 procedure on Poland as well. But not only that, not only that, we also devoted a substantial amount of time to argue about what we call the Copenhagen dilemma that, that, that took place between 2009 and 2014. The Copenhagen dilemma is how is it, how is it possible that candidates are examined as to the consistency of those values in their transition on the way in to the European Union. But once they are there, there's no way we can make it, those values enforceable. No, uh, well, uh, th th there has been, of course, ground for set in motion the provisions of Article 7, including the preventive one, which is Article 7, Paragraph 1, and the enforcement ones, the coercive ones, which are Paragraphs 2 and 3, second and third of that Article 7. But there's been more than that. So we, we've had a, 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 a thorough discussion of which are the tools at disposal of the European architecture to make sure that those values are actually binding. And we have made the difference between the preventive tools and the enforcement tools. As to the preventive tools, we discussed about the pathway that has been highlighted by the experience of the so-called European semester. And of course, the experience of the Justice Core Board because they are both two preventive tools to make sure that countries are examined regularly on certain parameters that I identified as objective and comprehensive. So all of the member states are subject to that examination. And with those uh, examples in mind, we came to the idea of a rule of law, fundamental rights and, democ and, and democracy framework, which would we give way what we call now a policy cycle in which all of the countries would be encompassed. That is a preventive mechanism to make sure that all of the countries are examined on regular basis on a comprehensive examination and with objective parameters that we can all stick to and make them reliable so that we can enhance also or, or put back on track again, mutual trust, which has been so much eroded. And by the way, is the background of certain episodes that have been taking place as to some legal tools that were meant to be much more effective as it is the case of the European arrest warrant. Why the European arrest warrant has been subject to, to a discussion or to an argument? Precisely because certain rulings of the European Court of Justice have only noticed that there is an erosion of mutual trust on the grounds of uh, the variety of prison conditions in member states, on the grounds of variety of criminal codes in the member states, on the grounds of variety as to the standards to securing independence of the judiciary, which is a major value enshrined in Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So in order to regain and, and, and to relaunch the, the whole process of mutual trust, we came to the idea of a rule of law, rule of law democracy and fundamental rights policy cycle and framework. And we engaged in talks and in discussions, taking the initiative in the European Parliament with the Commission so that the Commission would come up, would come up with an actual implementation of this idea and it actually, it actually happened. It actually happened. Now we see a rule of law framework, which is not exactly what we wanted it to be, but at least it's a step forward. We wanted to encompass not only rule of law, but also fundamental rights and democracy. Why we think it's so important that the framework is comprehensive of all of the component elements of the equation, 
because they are intertwined. Sometimes democracy is about protecting rights. Democracy, we insisted, it's not only about ruling by majority, it's also by sticking to the rules of the game, to the rules, to the rule by law. Democracy is not imposing the will of majority. Democracy takes protecting minorities. Democracy takes protecting the right of the opposition to oppose you, to dissent from your opinion, to assemble against you, to demonstrate against you when you're a majority. Democracy takes the, 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 the trust that minorities may turn to be my majorities tomorrow, and they have every right to do so, and to have that, that aspiration in, a, in an open and democratic society. Those elements are intertwined in a number of examples. When it takes to discrimination against minorities, maybe gypsies, maybe Roma, maybe Jewish communities, maybe LGBT, that's a matter of fundamental rights, but it's also a matter of democracy too. And when it comes to protecting the rights of those minorities, you take institutional tools, you take judicial remedies all the way, if there is a constitutional court, all the way to the constitutional court and to the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice as well, as it has been the case in a number of rulings by the European Court of Justice. So the elements are intertwined. We wanted it to be large scope, not only rule of law framework, but rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy framework. We wanted to be uh, involved, the European Parliament to be involved, but it's, it's a commission. We wanted an independent channel. So, but the commission is to assess by objective parameters, as the case of the Justice Co Board, maybe counting on some expertise, of course, not only think tanks, which are of relevance, uh, academic, institutions, of course, the Venice Commission, which is more and more author, uh, authorized in this, uh, of, uh, the opinions of the commission, Venice Commission are ever more authoritative when it comes to assessing uh, the, the, the situation in, in member states. But anyhow, this, this preventive rule of law framework is a major step forward. And we are uh, 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 expecting it to become a true policy cycle in which through the dialogue, not only the interinstitutional dialogue, the institutional agreement, we wanted an institutional agreement between the Council and the Commission and the European Parliament to, 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 to clear the path all the way, but also through the uh, dialogue with the member states authorities, we can create a truly uh, uh, community, European community of values and principles which are of binding nature and common understanding of the importance of the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. But then we also came to the idea of the rule of law conditionality. We made a very strong point on this idea. Why? Because let's face it, we, we tackled the so-called Copenhagen dilemma. We set in motion the Article 7 procedure insofar as it was within our powers. The majority that it took in the European Parliament to call the Council to consider the clear risk of a serious breach of systemic nature against the values enshrined in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union in two cases, Hungary and Poland, for good reason. Because we have seen that in a very abrupt period of time, in a very short period of time, and only under the will of a single ruling party, enjoying absolute majority in the respective, in the relevant parliamentary houses, in the same, in the case of Poland and the National Assembly in the case of Hungary, they have imposed a total agenda to provoke, to bring about an upheaval, a constitutional upheaval, what's been called a constitutional breakdown in both legal systems. So we sent, the message that Article 7 was to be taken seriously. But we are well aware that Article 7 has a cumbersome procedure and has its shortcomings too. It takes unanimity, exception being made of the country concerned in the final end of the sanctionary dimension of its provision, which is very unlikely ever to take place. So insofar as it does not take place, we want something more effective. That is why we came about with the idea of the so-called rule of law conditionality. Thank with you. Message, Can you please conclude? Can you please yes, conclude? With, with, yes, I'm concluding with this message. With this message, if we are to um, be effective, we must we must make sure that those countries, in contempt of the European Court of Justice rulings, as it is the case of course of, of course of Poland, 
which is in contempt of the ruling on the retirement of judges, on the discrimination of salaries, be man or woman, on the grounds of the so-called disciplinary chamber, those countries which are in contempt of the European Court of Justice rulings, and those countries which mix not only their assault on the independence of judiciary with high levels of corruption when managing the European funds would be denied access to European funds insofar as they do not show full compliance with the, Euro, with the rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy requirements. That is the point we have made. We came to an agreement with the council and now we only hope the council to stick to this agreement with the European Parliament because we are well aware that both Hungary and Poland and now Slovenia too are opposing their veto against the whole package, multi-annual financial framework, budget, recovery fund from which <laughs> so much is expected and so many needs are to be met with those recovery funds of the European Union because they oppose the rule of law conditionality. The European par Parliament is serious about this. We want this rule of law conditionality to be abide, in, abide uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the Council as an agreement with the European Parliament. And this, this is a, a very strong point for the majority of the European Parliament. And we only hope that those in denial of the binding nature of the values enshrined in Article 2 are not going to get away with it. That is my contribution to this discussion. I am only expecting the Q and A uh, round of uh, the second second round to exchange views with the rest of the participants of this discussion and this panel. Thank you. Bye Thank now. you. Thank you, Juan, for laying out so clearly the position of Parliament in these very important issues. Uh, I move immediately to Tineke. Tineke, you have the point. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and, and also thanks to the Commissioner to explain again about, about the, this important annual report. There is not so much time left, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. I want to address three topics, more some more general uh, remarks on the report and the tools we have on the role of Parliament and on the scope. Um, I think it's indeed a very important first step, this annual report, because we now have a common basis for actions, uh, which we really need for to protect the rule of law and democracy. It can be used as a tool for the EU institutions, but I also think it's very important for the uh, national level, not only for the governments, but for preliminary rulings, for NGOs, for ombudsmen, etc. Um, and it's also good, of course, that the situation in all member states is uh, uh, addressed, uh, not only to signal our early tendency, so really to, to use it in a preventive manner, but also to make sure that there's no argument saying that there are double standards or uh, accusations only to specific targeted countries. I think we should make sure that the report functions as a credible and neutral source of information so that it cannot be challenged for being uh, um, biased or whatever. We had therefore preferred to involve independent experts as well, especially for the assessment to what extent there is a breach of the rule of law. And that part is uh, at the moment lacking now. The quality of the information is very good but um, it's still really rather descriptive, the information, and it does not offer conclusions uh, on the level of compliance and also not the actions that the commission foresees in order to uh, restore rule of law deficiencies. Um, and I think there is really a need for the commission's credibility and also for the effectiveness of a rule of law mechanisms to be ready and to show it's ready to use all its available tools. Uh, it's, it's true, of course, what the Commission is saying, there are a lot of infringement procedures already undertaken, but I think there is a, an avenue to, uh, to improve that. If you look at the report on Hungary, it really clearly shows sufficient grounds for an infringement procedure also based on Article 2 of the treaty, but the Commission is still rather hesitant to do so. Um, and also, I think it's very important to stay consistent and persistent. If you look now at, uh, you know, the infringement uh, uh, procedure undertaken uh, on um, uh, Poland, on the disciplinary chamber, it's important that now we have this interim measure of the Court of Justice that the Commission immediately starts also imposing fines and, you know, keeping the pressure on 
complying with uh, case law. And I think also it's important to use other avenues, not only uh, Article 2 or, uh, or um, uh, other legal grounds for the rule of law, but also I think uh, the level playing field. We have now complaints on uh, uh, um, state uh, aid in media uh, in Hungary. There are already complaints from 2016. I think it's really important that the Commission now shows it's ready to follow up to that and also start infringement procedures like that. So also make use of, uh, you know, our internal market and, and free movement uh, uh, um, uh, rights and rules. On the role of Parliament, I think we can conclude that it has been indispensable for uh, designing effective instruments for enforcing and protecting the rule of law. Um, if you look at the conditionality mechanism already touched upon by uh, Kuan, I think the parliament was really decisive uh, to have uh, uh, inserted uh, elements of the rule of law. Um, and I, I think now the, the outcome of the negotiation, I think it's the bare minimum. And indeed, we need to make sure that at least this outcome is being preserved. Um, also, the rule of law mechanism, and this was already an initiative from a few years ago, and I'm very happy to see that the Commission is really building on that uh, proposal of uh, the Parliament. But I think it's also important to include, to involve the Parliament if it comes to implement, implementing those instruments. Uh, because sometimes you really see hesitance from the member states because of political interests. They prevail, you know, that other interests are prevailing. And sometimes, now yeah, also within the Commission, of course, there are political decisions being made. And you see that in Parliament as well. Political groups tend to focus more on, uh, on countries where they do not rule, uh, you know. So, of course, this is part of the politics. But nevertheless, I think for the democracy, democratic legitimacy, it's important that Parliament can also trigger procedures, for instance. And we we have done so with Article 7, which is, I think, it's very important. But then still you see that Commission is treated differently than Parliament in Article 7 procedures by the Council. And I think we really should be treated on an equal footing. We should also be invited to Council meetings and hearings in order to make a case on why we triggered the procedure. And I think it's deplorable that we do not have a role in the conditionality mechanism. I think it would be important that we would also be able to trigger that procedure, but be sure we will monitor very closely how the commission is, uh, is implementing uh, this. And at the same time, I would like to remark that I think that the parliament would, would also need to take its own, use its own position. We can also, uh, uh, start legal procedures by, for instance, joining cases of the Commission or starting our own uh, uh, procedures. And I think we should not shy away from that as well. Last point is the scope. Uh, as Kuan also said, it, it, it's now focusing on four issues, the rule of law report, independent judiciary, anti-corruption, free media and free and fair elections. Uh, and I think this is a good first step, but I really hope that the Commission will consider to widen up its scope, uh, all uh, elements of institutional checks and balances, but also fundamental rights. I think this is not for, it's for a reason also part of Article 2 of the treaty. Uh, and uh, I think that we should also need to treat violations of fundamental rights in the same way as we do with breaches of the rule of law. And if it would be part of the whole system, we would also have a more appropriate monitoring system of fundamental rights throughout uh, at the EU level of all EU member states, together with FRA, but also the UN and the Council of Europe. And if I may mention an example on the area where I uh, often uh, work a lot on, is uh, uh, the fundamental rights uh, compliance at our external borders of people who are not our inhabitants, but who are under our control and where we have responsibility. People who try to ask for asylum, try to arrive on our borders to get protection. And we see now uh, in, in many European states at our external borders that they are prevented from entering the territory. Uh, through pushbacks, where also their right to asylum is being uh, uh, is being denied, and often also accompanied with uh, with violence. I think that these are violations of core fundamental rights of the EU, 
and therefore should also be treated, you know, in the same way, in the same framework of our rule of law debates and instruments. Um, now the Commission has uh, proposed uh, an obligation for member states to have a national monitor mechanism in place at the screening uh, 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 procedure. I think the scope should be widened. It should cover all areas of the borders. But nevertheless, it's a start. But I really think it's not enough to keep it at a national level. We should really have something at the EU level and also make sure that agencies uh, uh, do not uh, uh, facilitate violations, but really are very strong in preventing uh, uh, violations and, res and, and promoting respect for fundamental rights. So, um, well, actually, as a conclusion, I think um, we are on the right way, but we need more credibility, more consistency and determination by all EU institutions, not only to, um, to effectively protect the rule of law, but also to serve as an example for our member states and to gain and keep confidence for of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Tineke, for bringing back again the question of scope and highlighting the Parliament's position to widen the scope to cover democracy and, their, and fundamental rights, and also for highlighting the uh, importance of timely action. Uh, so when looking at the, inter the relationship between monitoring and enforcement, and the question of equal treatment, equal footing of the European Parliament as representative of EU citizens and in compliance with the principle of an interinstitutional balance, uh, so, so that Parliament also plays a role in the implementation uh, phase. So thanks a lot. Let's now move to Hane, the Council of Europe. Please. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting the Council of Europe to take part in this important discussion as well. I promise I'll be brief. Uh, the rule of law is one of the statutory principles of the Council of Europe, along with pluralistic democracy and respect for human rights. The founding texts of the Council of Europe do not actually define the rule of law, and the, we don't have a specific mechanism just for rule of law issues. What we do to promote and strengthen the rule of law is to work through our monitoring mechanisms, our different monitoring bodies, the European Court of Human Rights, in particular the Venice Commission and Greco, but there are also a number of other such bodies in the wider human rights field. And uh, the Venice Commission is an advisory body, but the others I've mentioned are treaty-based mechanisms. So states undertake formally to accept the scrutiny of the monitoring body, usually through uh, on-site visits, and then to implement their recommendations. And thanks to this work, we have a, a very detailed uh, picture of where the, the gaps are and the shortcomings. Um, we also have uh, country-based the monitoring work going on in the Parliamentary Assembly and the Human Rights Commissioner, but it's a different format, so it's not really what I'm talking about here. Um, as other speakers have said very well, we are seeing at the moment that in a small number of our member states, the recommendations that we issue are not being followed, and that's especially the case in the areas of judiciary and the courts, also anti-corruption to some extent. You're all very familiar with these situations. We like to think that these steps are hopefully not irreversible, and that is where our monitoring mechanisms come into play, both the classic ones like Greco and, for example, Monival, which I didn't mention, but also the preventive advisory bodies like the Venice Commission. The way it works is that we present the governments with an assessment of uh, what we have found, and this assessment is done against a, an agreed list of clear benchmarks and then recommendations for what they could do to be in line uh, with their legal commitments. And I have to say that we are not short of work. It's a constant battle for uh, political will, uh, the will to implement, the will to change mentalities, even if you like it. It's, it's not easy. Um, in addition to, to these quite formal structures, we also provide uh, a lot of ad hoc advice to governments, uh, institutional, constitutional, legislative reforms especially in the area of the judiciary and anti-corruption. And the, again, the basis of that advice is, of course, the findings of the monitoring, monitoring mechanism, especially the case law of the court, but also the other bodies that I've mentioned. And here, I have to say, we have an excellent dialogue with the European Commission. We're very careful, generally, that as organizations, we are consistent and mutually complementary in the messages that we deliver. It's something that uh, we appreciate very much. For example, recently, we were, we were in touch about the constitutional court crisis in Ukraine or the situation of the 
Superior Council of Magistrates in Moldova. These are just a few examples. So we were very pleased to be able to contribute to the first annual rule of law review, which we consider a very impressive exercise, not least given the time within which uh, these reports were prepared. You probably have seen that the council bodies are widely cited in those reports, especially uh, three of them, the Venice Commission, Greco, but also the CEPEJ, which, by the way, provides the efficiency and quality data that goes into the justice scoreboard, which was mentioned earlier in a very good collaboration also with the Commission. We are able to feed the findings of our bodies into the work of the European Union, but as the Commissioner mentioned earlier, of course, then it's up to the Commission and the EU to reflect and assess and decide what they want to do with that information and, and to take the process forward after that. So we have very distinct roles in that way. I will leave it at that. I just want to say that as you perhaps can hear, the rule of law is really a key issue for the Council of Europe. And it's one that engages uh, most, if not all of our institutions right now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anne, for keeping it brief and also for highlighting the crucial role that so many bodies in the Council of Europe play in the monitoring, uh, the robustness of, of the monitoring coming from different bodies uh, and the collaboration, you know, the, the pluralism, the, the rule of law pluralism that we see, positive uh, cooperation uh, in the diagnosing, you know, the diagnosis of, uh, you know, country-specific contexts. Uh, so really, thank you so much for bringing the experience and also the contribution of, of the Council of Europe to the debate and to the panel. Now we move to the United Nations. Birgit. Thank you, distinguished commissioner, members of the European Parliament, colleagues. Thank you very much for the invitation. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights considers the rule of law a prerequisite for the enjoyment of all human rights. But let's face it, respect for the rule of law is in decline, not only in the EU, but worldwide. And this phenomenon has further found fertile ground in the unprecedented circumstances created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many arguments have already been made on why it is important for the EU to protect the rule of law in Europe. I would like to add two more. Just last week, the Council of the EU adopted the EU Action Plan on Human Rights and Democracy. There's great emphasis on supporting the rule of law, which is mentioned 11 times in the Council conclusions. And in many parts of the world, our field presences actually work with EU delegations in support of the rule of law. But for the EU to be credible on the rule of law in third countries, it is essential that the rule of law is upheld inside the EU, both as regards EU member states, as well as in the EU's own actions. So this is about the credibility of Europe on the world stage. We very much welcome the first annual report on the rule of law by the commission released in September, the inclusive consultations that led to the adoption of the report and the country specific discussions that took place on 22 November for five member states. If a peer review takes place for all countries and the report is brought as the commissioner has highlighted to the national level for discussion and debate, it can certainly contribute to the strengthening of a rule of law culture and the resilience of democracy. The question, of course, is will this suffice to restore the rule of law where it has been weakened? The second argument for standing up for the rule of law is that EU member states have binding legal obligations to uphold the rule of law that stem from international human rights treaties and standards. While the concept of the rule of law, just as for the Council of Europe, is not defined also in international human rights law, the UN human rights treaties cover the rights that can be considered as essential to the rule of law. And I would like to open a bracket here about the scope of the Commission's rule of law report, also as uh, the Commission will soon start preparing the next one. When the Commission first embarked on this report, it was not sure which rights would be assessed and how the rule of law would be defined. It is very positive in our view that the Commission has not interpreted the rule of law in a narrow sense, and that it has covered aspects like media pluralism or institutional checks and balances. It is a rare exercise of introspection at the regional level and the first official baseline, uh, as a first official baseline, it constitutes a really useful tool for advocacy and engagement. However, to align with international human rights standards, we would encourage the Commission to adopt an even larger scope and to approach the various pillars from a human rights perspective. This means 
assessing the right to equality before the law, the right to a fair trial, the right to liberty and security of the person, freedom of opinion and expression, of which media pluralism is only one element, the right to peaceful assembly and association, because these rights are a prerequisite for transparent and accountable government, and the right to participate in public affairs. The right to peaceful assembly has come particularly under pressure. And from an international human rights perspective, it would be difficult to exclude this right from an assessment of the rule of law. I would also plead for a stronger anchoring of the EU's report in UN legal instruments and jurisprudence. EU member states are a party to all core international human rights treaties except the Migrant Workers Convention. The Commission report, however, only selectively or uh, does not reference at all UN norms or standards. Uh, for decades also, the treaty bodies, the special procedures of the UN Human Rights Council and the Universal Periodic Review have been monitoring the rule of law or elements thereof in EU member states. Country-specific assessments and recommendations from the UN mechanisms were, however, only selectively and scarcely reflected in the Commission's report. I would therefore like to make the case today for enriching the next report with, on the one hand, references to international treaties and jurisprudence from the UN human rights mechanisms, and on the other hand, also findings from national human rights institutions. Because of the large number of submissions to the Commission's report, and the significant information already available from international, regional, and national monitoring mechanisms, the Universal Periodic Review methodology could be an interesting example of how to deal with this. For those of you who are not familiar with the Universal Periodic Review process, there are three documents prepared in advance of the peer review. First, a national report, which is prepared by the state. Secondly, a compilation of information from the UN mechanisms and agencies. And thirdly, a summary of information submitted by other stakeholders, and that's regional organizations, national human rights institutions, equality bodies, and civil society. We wonder if the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, as an independent agency, which already has a mandate to engage with national human rights institutions, equality bodies, and civil society, could be asked to compile and summarize the information and submissions from international human rights mechanisms, the UN regional organization, national institutions, equality bodies, and civil society prior to the commission's assessment so that stakeholder submissions become more easily accessible in a user-friendly format. And of course, in addition to being made available in their entirety, along with input from the states under review, such a compilation could then inform the European commission's assessment. The coherence between the international, regional, and national systems is important to us, not just to foster legal certainty for states and domestic courts, but also to preserve the legitimacy of the UN human rights architecture, as well as national human rights institutions, particularly at a time of a backlash against human rights and the rule of law. If we connect EU law policy and decision making to the international legal framework, as the EU does very well in external action, we strengthen the international rules-based order. But if EU initiatives refer only to European instruments and mechanisms, they weaken this order. We would also suggest to the Commission to use the indicators on rights that are covered by the rule of law that have been developed by the UN Human Rights Office, as well as the universal indicators of SDG target 16. And for those of you interested in reading more, we've uh, issued a publication, the case for our human rights approach to the rule of law in the EU, which you can find on our website. Finally, the rule of law must also be upheld in the EU's own actions and protect all persons regardless of nationality. The Pact on EU Asylum and Migration foresees a pre-entry screening procedure which may take up to 10 days. How will migrants be able to access legal aid in this period? It is also fundamental that the rule of law is upheld by the EU border agency Frontex. And I would like to close by echoing previous speakers who plead for an approach that breaks down the silos. Discussions on the rule of law are often artificially separated from human rights and democracy, but in reality, everything is connected. There can be no democracy without human rights, no human rights without democracy, and neither without the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit, for your call to break up the silos.
also to present and bring us um, the UPR, uh, Contribution and Methodology uh, in the compilation of a situational picture. I'm one of the few who enjoy enormously going to the UPR website and checking all the country specific uh, compilations and overviews because it does have very interesting, important information when checking monitoring of values in light of, in areas of EU law. Uh, so it's absolutely crucial. Also, you mentioned the FRA, of course, the EU Fundamental Rights Agency that is already playing a role and that it could play a bigger role, more substantive role in many different ways, um, in welcome ways. So really thanks, uh, Birgit. Um, I'm being, in the meantime, uh, reading your questions for those of you who are still with us, uh, who have been uploading questions. And I would like to bring them back also, some of them uh, to the commissioner, in addition to highlighting some of the aspects that were raised. Uh, commissioner Reinders, of course, uh, many of our discussants have mentioned questions of methodology and scope. I wondered if you could uh, comment on these elements, on how to go forward with the silos approach and the uh, rule of law pluralism. Um, so as to ensure, um, uh, you know, this cross fertilization between different bodies even farther, even farther. And then, as you all may imagine, many people have asked about the current debate on EU rule of law, <laughs> uh, conditionality in the budget. Uh, an overwhelming uh, number of questions uh, that, of course, I, I was also quite eager in bringing to the panel as well. Um, so we saw the Hungarian and the Pol Polish government publishing a paper saying that the conditionality should only be linked to the financial interests, safeguarding the financial interests of the EU. Um, Commissioner, what is your view? But also the panelists, I will also give you final remarks before we close up. What is your view on this uh, Hungarian and Polish government proposal? Uh, one participant mentions the possibility of enhanced cooperation on even intergovernmental way forward, not including the Hungarian and Polish government. Uh, it seems they don't need the money. So people are wondering if all the rest could go forward, um, not including these two. And then which ways to unblock the situation? Uh, again, are there other options? People are saying, uh, even mentioned the Court of Justice in Luxembourg to intervene. Um, so Commissioner, would you like to start and share with us your views on this? I take my mic off. It's matter maybe with the mic. Uh, yes, I, I will say maybe some words on the on the, the main uh, issues that we have raised. Uh, first of all, from uh, the, the the different interventions. Again, uh, first remarks about why uh, do you uh, organize a process without uh, a real new uh, um, body of external experts, independent experts. Um, first of all, I have all the time. Uh, in different capacities, see the difficulty to, to define what is an independent expert, but we'll decide maybe later what is possible to do. But I want to say, I've said in my introductory remarks, it's a non assessment from the Commission. It's very clear, the Commission is the guardian of the treaty and we come out with an assessment of the Commission. Using div a diversity of sources, I will say some words on this, coming from many different kinds of actors, the member states, of course, I've said, but many stakeholders at the international level, like the UN or the Council of Europe and the different mechanisms of the Council of Europe, but also at the EU level, like the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also many associations at EU level and at the national level. But of course, uh, to, to work with an external expert body, uh, that there is a number of problems in terms of set of legitimacy first, the balance of inputs, and the accountability of the, the reserves, the accountability is in the, on the shoulders of the Commission. The Commission uh, tried to work with all the possible source. Of course, if the Parliament, when uh, we discuss on the, on the report, want to ask for some experts or a panel of experts uh, to analyze the situation, to give a reaction, why not? I've said it to the Parliament, why not to organize something? But it's a, a report from the Commission. It was organized in such a way. And I want to say it's uh, the classical reaction from the beginning of the European Union to say that, again, the Commission is the guardian of the treaties and we need to come out with our own assessment. Then it's possible to 
take care, of course, of many uh, possible expertise from different other actors. About the scope, I was pleased to listen to the different reactions because, first of all, it was possible to stay with a very strict scope and to discuss, first of all, about the independence, the quality and efficiency of the justice system. But we have taken the opportunity of the report to come with all the chapters, I said, with the corruption framework, media pluralism, and checks and balances. But I know that there are some uh, requests to do more. We will do more. We'll come with a report on the, the Charter for Fundamental Rights. So you know that this year we will define a new strategy on the, the Charter. And then next year we'll come with a first report on the uh, Charter for Fundamental Rights. So it will be possible to cover uh, the fundamental rights. It will be possible also with the new democracy action plan to discuss about all the democratic processes. And so again, if you have different reports, the rule of law report that we are uh, working on, the report on the Charter, and uh, maybe a report on the democracy action plan, it's possible to organize a debate at the council level, in the parliament, in the national parliament, on all those issues. So I'm not against to try to uh, organize a broader scope with the different instruments. But about the rule of law uh, report, it was very important to start and to start with the first annual report. And we'll continue. I must say that I've seen some questions in the chat about the, sc the scope for the next report. My uh, position is to try to stick to the same methodology and the same scope, maybe with some adjustment but not to change every year the content because we need to have a reaction from the member states and we need to see if it's possible for the member states to implement real reforms to improve the situation in the different fields and then year after year we'll see next year again we'll have a report on the charter um i, I must say is it sufficient i also listened that uh, in the comments of course not it's a preventive tool so we want to use uh, the report as a preventive tool uh, I said to receive some proposal from the member states to make some progresses, but we need also to enforce the rule of law. And it's the reason why, except with the Article 7, we continue to work with infringement proceedings. And I fully share with you that we need to be very active on this and we need to have a robust and solid uh, analysis before to go to the court. I've said sometimes, I know that there are many reactions to say, why not a more faster reaction in some cases, but we don't have exactly the same timeline than Twitter. We are working with a legal analysis and we are trying to be sure that we have a robust argumentation to go before the court to have a real change, chance to have a success before the court and not just to give a reaction immediately on Twitter. Uh, it's not the same job maybe for the commission than from some uh, other actors in, in, this, uh, in this way. And of course, the conditionality will be an important part of the uh, other tools that it will be possible to use. Uh, but the rule of law report is, first of all, a, a preventive tool. And about the uh, link with the UN, of course, we are uh, very open to work more and more like we are doing with the Council of Europe, in la to, to work more and more with the UN. I know very well the uh, Universal Periodic Review. In the previous capacity, I was uh, uh, in the Human Rights Council to present the situation in my home country. So <laughs> I know very well the process about the uh, Universal Periodic Review, and we are very open to, to take care of the different indicators and the mechanisms of the UN. But again, we try to take many different sources in the uh, preparation of the report, not only at the national level, at the European level, but also at the international level. We continue to do that. About uh, your question on the conditionality, first of all, the reference to the Court of Justice was just to say if we have a new legislative act, of course, it's possible to challenge such an act before the Court of Justice. It's the rule of law, again. And so if there are some contestation, why not? But the main issue uh, are the following. First, uh, I want to remember that some years ago, it was possible to, in, to think about the installation of the European Public Prosecutor Office. I will uh, work, continue to work on this because I'm in charge to install the new uh, Prosecutor Office. I'm hoping that it will be possible in the first quarter next year to have a real uh, implementation of the uh, Prosecutor Office to protect the EU budget against fraud, abuses, corruption, case, and so on, with prosecution and uh, investi investigations first, and prosecutions maybe at the EU level. And it was possible to do that uh, with 22 member states, not all. Uh, so with some opting, classical opting out 
for criminal matters in Denmark, in Sweden, and in Ireland, but also with a, a non-participation from Hungary and Poland. And at the same moment, I've seen that it was possible to start a discussion also about the conditionality, because if you don't have the capacity to work with the uh, European Public Prosecutor Office in all the member states, you need to think also uh, about the ways to protect the EU budget against different kind of uh, uh, deficiencies in the, in the rule of law. The second uh, element, of course, now we have an agreement between the co-legislators, because you have seen there is a qualified majority in the Council, and there's a real support in the parliament. So we don't want to change. We want to stay with a very broad scope and a very efficient mechanism, because I know that in the proposal of the commission, uh, we have tried to defend to the end, the reverse qualified majority, like in the uh, macroeconomic policy, but you know that to come from unanimity to a qualified majority, it's a real progress because it's uh, the most difficult issue maybe at the open level to discuss about the majority rules. But then, is it possible to uh, to find a way to the solution? Of course, it's in the hand of the German presidency for the moment to try, first of all, uh, to organize the process. And so the first uh, possible solution is to convince the two uh, member states to take part in the process. Uh, and there are many discussions on, on this. I don't want to elaborate on that. It's in the hand of the, the presidency for the moment. But of course, we are sure that all the possible solutions are on the table. And again, it's the advantage of uh, a long presence in all those discussions. In the previous other capacities as Minister of Finance, I was around the table when it was necessary uh, to organize a new treaty on budgetary issues with 25th member states uh, before to go further to the uh, European semester and all, other kind of regulations. So there are many uh, possible uh, solutions, but the main solution is to try to take everybody on board because the best solution, of course, is to stay with uh, 27 member states and deciding about the MFF and the next generation EU to organize a real recovery and resilience process and then to uh, have the conditionality to be sure that it's possible to protect the uh, uh, rule of law in all the member states. And I want to say that it's uh, the reason why the report was so important to show that we are doing the job in all the member states on an equal footing in the 27. And we have concerns and remarks in all the member states. But of course, sometimes it's more systemic. And that's the real issue that we have seen with the Article 7 and that we are discussing now. So again, we'll try to continue to, to, try to convince the two uh, member states. But again, uh, we don't have any intention at the commission level like I'm sure in the Parliament, to change the uh, agreement reach uh, uh, about the uh, conditionality. The problem is not to have a, an agreement on the budget on the MFF and the next generation EU to go forward. But again, all the possible solutions are on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We need to move towards closing the meeting. But before, I wanted to give each some of the discussions who would like to come back two minutes. It's like leave a committee. So you only have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> how, would I, how would I to start? Okay, thank you. One, thank you again. And thank, thank you again, Sergio. And thanks to the Commission and thank the rest of the discussions. Of course, I took much interest in following each and every one of them. But I would like to address the main point, which is Hungary and Poland opposing veto against the rule of law conditionality. I'll make it right. This idea didn't come out of the blue. It's been the outcome of a thorough process of both legal and political discussions with strong arguments that have been sorted out to make the right choice. And the final outcome that we have seen, seeing the light of the day, is not, of course, meeting every demand of the European Parliament. We wanted, actually, reverse qualified majority. We wanted the European Parliament to be involved. We wanted a panel of a, a independent assessment. But insofar as it is an agreement with the Council and uh, it has been sanctioned in the trilogue. It has to be respected. I, I only hope that Hungary and Poland are not going to get with not going to get away with it because that would be an extremely negative message, a blackmail in a type of war that has been made by those countries which are in contempt of law against not only the majority of the Council, twenty four against three that that could be the sum, but also against the majority of the European Parliament, against the majority of the European will that 
we have to make clear that rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy go all together, and they are binding for all of the member states. So I only hope it will be respected. I think that the threat is not only unacceptable, it's not believable. Of course, it was foretold. It was not a surprise, but the short answer is that they cannot go away with it. And the second point goes to the European Court of Justice. I think one of the most relevant indicators of how the situation has been deteriorated throughout the years is precisely that once upon a time that a country would be sanctioned by the European Court of Justice would be the ultimate thing. I can think, for, for instance, of Spain in the early 90s when we were still young as members of the European Union being sanctioned by the European Court of Justice. Wow, that is a major blow. That should have never happened. So we must do everything to correct our behavior so that we meet the standards that, that have been set by the European Court of Justice. Precisely an indicator of how much rule of law is eroded and mutual trust is eroded is that the European Court of Justice, which has the task of securing the respect of the law, Article 19 of the Treaty of the European Union, is much is more and more disregarded with contempt by member states, which are simply ignoring the very significance of European law and the European Union, which is precisely uh, an, exper an experiment which is successful in so far that law matters insofar as European law is supranational and it's binding upon all of the member states. The example goes to Hungary and Poland, the final word. Do you see that Poland has been sanctioned four times by the European Court of Justice and yet Poland is in denial of, uh, of incorporating the, the impact of the rulings of the European Court of Justice. So that is a major thing. We got to make sure that this process goes, goes not any further and we make it right by all means at our disposal to, make the, to, to, to send the message through that law matters. We are in times of crisis. Law matters, especially in times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Tineke. Yes, <laughs> to start with the, with the last point of Juan, I, um, I mean, Mr. Reynolds mentioned the, the Twitter pace, you know, that we expect uh, speediness of Twitter. I wouldn't call that a Twitter uh, pace if you think of an intermeasure uh, imposed last April by the Court of Justice. Uh, I, I think it would then be uh, possible for the Commission within that time frame of eight months to to uh, come up with sanctions like fines, for instance, in order to make sure that uh, the case law of the Court of Justice uh, is complied with. I think all actors are uh, have complementary roles and we really should use them all in order to make it effective. Regarding the questions from the audience, um, I, I hope that the Commission will uh, adopt an, a, a wide interpretation of the rule of law and uh, how it's related to the union budget, because I really think that uh, even, you know, that that is very quickly affects the union budget. But on the other hand, I also would have preferred that uh, there would have been a larger uh, scope. So not only in relation to the union budget, but also that the union budget is also used as an incentive to make sure that uh, member states comply with, with the treaty obligations. But now that, that that's not foreseen in the mechanism, but still let's hope for an effective uh, application. Um, regarding the experts, I agree with the commission, of course, it should be the commission's responsibility and we don't need a new body. That's not uh, exactly what I envisage. But I think it would really, you know, be important to make sure it cannot be contested to make sure that we have a neutral and, and right basis uh, uh, also in, in, in um, uh, also with the involvement of experts that would maybe make it even more credible. But I really appreciate that many sources are being used of, of a lot of institutions. So I think it's already a very uh, strong. My, my, my most important uh, point of critique is that uh, it is not accompanied by conclusions to what extent 
this information uh, makes clear that there is a breach of rule of law. Uh, and I think that would really be an asset for also follow up actions, not only by the Commission, but also by other institutions or uh, actors. Thank you. Thanks, Lineke. Birgit, uh, Hani, any final points? I, I would have two quick points, if I may. One is about the, the experts. Um, of course, it's an interesting question whether there should be some sort of new format for, for monitoring by the EU itself of the rule of law. And I would only say that we would like to, to hope that it would be mutually complementary to what already exists and that we would, would be very happy to be part of the, those who provide the expertise just as we are now. The second point I wanted to make echoes what has been said by everybody, which is that what makes this rule of law situation that we have now so, so uh, difficult to address is that the backsliding we're seeing is deliberate. It's not because there's, there are not enough resources or because somebody has not understood quite what the implications of the obligations are. It's by design. And that makes it so difficult to, to do anything about in a meaningful way, if almost no matter from where you come from with solutions. Thank you so much, Hanna. Birgit. Thank you very much, Sergio. And uh, I would really like to commend the Commission and the Libe Committee for uh, doing their best and having a lot of courage in, uh, in standing up for the rule of law. Um, and that we, we stand ready to, to support you in your, in your efforts. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's the member states who sign the international human rights treaties. And so hereby also an appeal to all the duty bearers, the member states who might be on this call uh, of the importance for countries to uphold because there's a significant example of in this that other countries outside Europe are looking at. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I think there is a lot of courage in this panel. Uh, I see it. I see a lot of courage. Um, um, and um, really thanks everybody for for your presentations and, and your inputs. I mean, this uh, Hungarian government and Polish government affair uh, is of course of crucial importance for if they will get away with it. Of crucial importance for the legitimacy of governments coming to Brussels. Um, so bringing this issue at the very forefront of the council is indeed historic and it was only about time uh, I mean, one could perfectly expect this to happen. Uh, and here we are. Um, I think that uh, in this webinar, uh, I've really enjoyed, and I hope the participants have seen how much actually has been done in terms of monitoring and how important this issue is for different institutions, uh, European institutions, but also international and regional institutions, a lot of efforts being done uh, and this rule of law report is just one example, the work of the European Parliament's mechanism and proposals, another example, and they are mutually reinforcing and complementary. Uh, this has also come very clearly from the presentations of Hane and Birgit, uh, how actually this pluralism is something not only to cherish, but perhaps to further develop um, and, um, uh, and think through. So really big thanks to everyone. Um, you know, we need it this time. We've gone beyond time, but we need it this time. That's the conclusion, at least from <laughs> the organizer's point of view. I hope you enjoyed it. All of, also, all of you who are still with us, hope you enjoyed it too. And um, we look forward to the next opportunity to continue this conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everybody. Good to see Thank you on the screen. Thank you. Bye-bye.